Hello, everyone. My name is Allie Felker, and I am a co-lead of legislation with Push for Empowered Pregnancy. I would like to dedicate this next session to my son, Henry Justice Felker. We call him Hank, and he was stillborn on July 1st, 2020. I have with me his bear. That is his exact weight when he was born, um, still at just one day shy of being 32 weeks gestation. Tragically, stillbirth is not the only heartbreaking pregnancy outcome. Every day in this country, birthing people are dying or from or suffering the trauma of preventable complications, and infants are not making it through their first year. So with, I'm very, very honored to have with me so many amazing advocates um, who will be joining us on this panel. So um, let's do some quick housekeeping and then we'll um, get started with introductions. First, I'd like to ask that everyone um, please mute yourself if you are not speaking. Um, this is a discussion though. So once we get started with our introductions after we do our intros, um, please feel free to unmute at any point in time and jump into the conversation. So we'll go ahead and start with introductions. I'd like to ask, um, and I'll, I'll call out um, your names as well. We'll start with um, introducing yourself and your organization. What is your mission and what drives your work? So if um, we can have Shawnee Benton Gibson, if you can go ahead and start, we would love to hear um, who you are and what the work is that you, um, that you do. Greetings. Thank you so much, Allie. Um, and I will follow your lead by acknowledging my daughter, Shimani Makiba Gibson, who passed away in 2019 due to a birth-related pulmonary embolism. Um, for those who do not know me, my name is Shawnee Renee Benton Gibson. I am the co-founder of the ARIA Foundation. And the mission of ARIA is actually built into the name. It's an acronym that stands for the Advancement of Reproductive Innovation Through Artistry and Healing. And so we're committed to educating the community. We're committed to using art and ritual as um, a conduit for that and also um, activating healing so that we can move forward. And I believe wholeheartedly that the conversation about these losses um, and the ritual we engage in is action. And so I just want to make sure that I say that and then I pass on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Ani. Um, we will, uh, next let's have Amari Minard. And I apologize to anybody who I mispronounced your names. Good afternoon, everybody. How you doing? My name is Omari Maynard. This is Kari Maynard. Uh, I am also the co-founder of the ARIA Foundation. ARIA stands for the Advancement of Reproductive Innovation Through Artistry and Healing. And we are here brought through and by um, Shimani Gibson, my life partner, and she unfortunately passed away, like her mother said, in um, this, uh, excuse me, October 2019. And we are here to advocate and provide different innovative ways in order to spread this word um, of this maternal health crisis and, and to create a community in which we empower each other to know our birthing options and then also know um, and provide a community in which we can support each other through our birthing journeys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, can we have Lanisa Hello. Russ? Hi, everybody. And you got it right, Allie. I'm yes. Lanisa Russ. <laughs> I am the executive director of March for Moms, um, which was founded in 2017 as a nonpartisan solution oriented nonprofit. Um, and our mission is to align the diverse voices of families, healthcare providers, policymakers, and partners to advocate for mothers and families' health, well being, and equal access to care. Um, and something that drives our work is that we want to be a part of the collective collective effort of all moms and birthing people being able to experience a safe, healthy delivery without fear of dying during childbirth or after. Thank you very much. Um, next, let's have Emily Little. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Little. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director and founder of Nurturely. Nurturely is a nonprofit organization focused on equity in perinatal wellness and strengthening cultures of support for infants and caregivers. Um, so our focus is really on prevention 
on preventing systemic inequities. And I come to this space as a researcher, educator, and advocate, and also want to acknowledge that I do not have the lived experience of having been a survivor of stillbirth and want to just acknowledge my respect for fellow panelists and participants here today um, and the strength that you carry in being here to advocate for fellow parents. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's such an important part. And I mean, similarly, I want to acknowledge that I don't have the lived experience of a person of color or a person of a marginalized group. And so I think um, recognizing that is incredibly important. And I thank you so much for, for starting that. Um, let, next, let's uh, have Jill Weaver-Lenz. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone at PUSH uh, for having me here this afternoon. Um, like Ali said, my name is Jill Lenz. I am a professor of law at the University of Arkansas School of Law. I'm also a stillbirth mom. Um, my little guy, Caleb, uh, was stillborn at 37 weeks of pregnancy, and it will be five years next next month, and I'm still trying to figure out how to, how to uh, deal with that anniversary coming up. Um, and after Caleb died, I, I refocused my research and now I, I'm all about how laws affect stillbirth. So like tort law and medical malpractice and like vital statistics law and reproductive rights and justice and, and how, how those areas of law are affecting stillbirth prevention, affecting the experience of stillbirth, et cetera. Again, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, next, let's hear from Debbie Hain. Debbie, I have no idea how to pronounce your full name, so I'll let you go ahead and start doing that. Oh, it's okay. You would not be the first. Don't worry about it. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, I'm Deb Hain, BJ Bergia. Um, I am here uh, as Autumn's mom. Um, I lost Autumn. It'll be 11 years ago next um in two months um i this was not where i thought i would be in my life um i uh i founded the two degrees foundation here in new jersey um our goals are to improve stillbirth outcomes uh improve education and awareness around stillbirth and to provide hopefully be able to provide research so that we can start to address the issues um that we have here in new jersey and at a national level um i'm also, you know, the mission of, of all the work that I do, though, um, is really just to put stillbirth on the map across the board, whether we're in New Jersey, whether we're in the U.S., whether we are talking globally. Um, I think that stillbirth needs to be recognized and uh, finally be put on the map so that we can address these this uh, tragic maternal and family health crisis. Um, what drives the work that I do? I think that I would could say that, you know, I... I never knew that something like this could happen to me. Um, I think that the first time that someone hears about stillbirth should not be when it happens to them. Um, I never want to have my children ever experience this kind of pain. So that drives me. And I have a really hard time um, sitting idly by why tens of thousands of babies continue to die every year in this country. So. Um, that's me in a nutshell. So I'm just here doing my thing and uh, so grateful to have the opportunity to be surrounded, be invited to be here today and to be surrounded by so many um, inspirational and devoted um, families and professionals. Thanks. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, next, let's hear from Tina Motti. Thanks, Allie. Hi everyone, I'm Tina Motti. I am the co-founder of the Myers Wings Foundation and um, one of the reasons why I'm here today is, well, we started the Maya's Wings Foundation because we lost Maya last year in 2021 after um, IVF. We went through IVF and after 16 weeks, we lost her due to a placental abruption. And what we've learned from that process, I mean, needless to say, I was blindsided um, <laughs> because there's just a lack of education around the IVF process, what we should be expecting. And, um, and of course, it's not the, um, it's definitely not because there's a lack of information that's provided necessarily. It's more of the ability to get to that information. So we started the Myers Wings Foundation really to help empower patients and families that are going through that journey with information resources that they can um, get to easily and make sure that is vetted because there's definitely a lot of information out there in the website. So we definitely want to get that information and make sure it's vetted by clinicians, 
et cetera. And in addition to that, the loss of Maya ha helped us learn, um, unfortunately, the hard way that there's definitely a lot of placental abnormalities in IVF pregnancies or assisted reproductive technology when it comes in comparison to non-IVF pregnancies. So, so what we really want to do is, in addition to supporting families who are going through this journey um, and also supporting families who are going through infertility, is really to help advocate and support research around abnormal placentation and IVF pregnancies and hopefully utilize that information to translate to um, decrease placentation abnormalities for all pregnancies. I think all of us are here today is really to want to live in a world without pregnancy loss, um, preventable pregnancy loss. So that's something that I hold near and dear to my heart and joining this group today has been amazing and really wanna get the words out there around the Myers Wings Foundation and definitely want to help empower folks through that journey because there's a lot of information but wanna make sure that people can get to the right information and the correct information and to navigate through that information. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Tina. And last but certainly not least, um, LJ, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. I have experience, right? Not as a stillbirth. Um, that is not an experience I personally have. But what I can say is I'll start with before my introduction is my heart goes out to everyone because I hear this and I see this a lot in the work that I do. So I am LJ Johnson, the owner and the CEO of LJ's Powerhouse. And so what I do is essentially educate, empower, and motivate anyone with uterus, right, that they can live an amazing life despite chronic illness, right, despite everything that's going on. My population, my own diagnosis is I was diagnosed with endometriosis, and it took me 16 years to get that diagnosis. So throughout that process and the patients that I work with, I see a lot of things that go on, um, a lot of disparities, obviously, as a woman of color and getting the information that you needed. I love what Tina said. You know, sometimes it's not a lack of information. It's just being able to get a hold of those resources. So that's really what I do is bring in functional medicine, bring in the practitioners and really help you get to the root of the problem so that you can prevent some of these issues as you're going through a successful pregnancy. Thank you so very much, LJ. We'll go ahead and get started with our first question, and that is, what needs to change in order to improve outcomes for BIPOC families? Um, whoever wants to jump into this conversation, I think it's really important to realize um, there was somebody who spoke, and hopefully someone can tell me who this person was, but they said after the Aftershock documentary that birth, all people will be safe when Black people are safe in birthing places. And that has inspired me so much to really look at the racial discrepancies and to see that when we make this place a safe place for people of color, it will become a safe place for all of us. So um, whoever wants to start on that question, I would love to hear your insights. I'd love to jump in on that one. Um, gosh, I'm all, I'm getting very emotional. I'm getting to my feelings, right? Because this is a tough one. Um, what has to change? I would say there's so much that needs to change, but us as influencers, us as practitioners, raising awareness, right? We don't know what we don't know. There are things that I will post on Instagram and things that I will say in workshops that are common knowledge for me, right? But for someone else, they are totally oblivious, right? So the biggest thing is raising the awareness. And then I guess I'm going to say my second thing, because I know there's going to be lots of things that people are going to add, lots of gems. My second thing would be is you know, stop hiding in plain sight. So many times we are afraid, we're feeling fear, we don't want someone to know. And it's like, yes, we went been through things, right? Yes, they're painful. I'm giving myself chills just talking about it. But it's like sharing our story is what educates and empowers others. A lot of times, like I said, circling back, you don't know what you don't know, right? So unless you're sharing your story, unless you're raising awareness, I mean, there's definitely lots of things that could change on the practitioner side, you know, people actually recognizing our pain, listening to us the first time, you know, not telling us that we're crazy, all of those things. But I would say the biggest thing is, you know, sharing the awareness and then stop hiding in plain sight, share your story, talk about it, because you just never know who needs that information. And that will actually empower Empower them and help them advocate so that when they do go into the appointments, when they are talking to their practitioners, they can get better information and better care. Um, I'll jump in and thank you, Allie, for mentioning Aftershock. Um, Omari and I are the subjects, two of the subjects of the Aftershock documentary. I'm grateful that um, my daughter's memory is carrying on through what um, LJ just shared by us 
being willing to be vulnerable and share our stories. Uh, what I will quickly say is that knowledge is not enough. Um, my daughter was very knowledgeable. We're a family that has been a part of the reproductive, uh, reproductive justice movement for over a decade. And she still passed away with a doula, with a midwife, um, eating well, exercising, um, researching. Um, yeah, it still happened to her and it was preventable. Um, the conversations have to start way before you are um, navigating whether you want to become a parent or not. Um, when I think about my granddaughter, Anari, who's five years old, I'm really thinking about by the time she enters into elementary school, well, she's about to go, or junior high school, that the conversation is about what her body can do, what she gets to choose to do. Like people have an aversion around starting the conversation that young, but I wish when I was younger, someone would have talked to me about what the proper names were for my vagina, my reproductive parts, instead of calling it pocketbook and sugar bowl and down there and the thing and you know, all of the other stuff. It starts with the language. And um, I keep going to events where people have chosen to be present for me to speak or Mari to speak, um, you know, to talk about the documentary, to talk about the movement. And there are still people that are in the audience and in those spaces that don't know about the disparities that BIPOC folks experience, not just around reproductive health, but across the board. Um, finally, I will say that the conversation also about um, structural racism, institutional racism, implicit bias, I'm beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. When George Floyd was choked out on the, on, on the streets and we all witnessed that across the world, I'm like, now we're using language like white supremacy culture, because that's the language that is um, driving the outcomes that we experience. So I'll pass to one of um, the other panelists um, and just thank you for allowing us to be here. And I can go next um, and follow Shawnee. Um, so, you know, what I wanna add to the conversation is um, I think passing federal and state legislation and policies that we know can improve outcomes for BIPOC families is important, um, such as extending postpartum Medicaid coverage to one year after giving birth. Um, and it gives birth and people access to postpartum care and helps them remain insured when, you know, if they're experiencing something that they know doesn't feel right, they don't have to worry about the cost of going to the doctor or going to an ER to, you know, get checked out. Um, and as of May 12th, there are only 13 states that have implemented a 12-month expansion, and there's only another 15 states planning to implement it as well. So we have far to go with making sure that our entire country is on board with that. I think the only additional piece that I want to add, and I really appreciate this question because it really brings to light or really opens up that dialogue about the disparity that we see and oftentimes it's not talked about. And I love the fact that we get the opportunity to talk about it. I think in addition to the advocacy work that we do for the patients, for ourselves, it, and the additional federal policies, et cetera, I think we need to educate our clinicians. It needs to start with education. I'm a clinical pharmacist, and I can tell you going through my own, you know, journey of school, we don't talk about these things. And I think anti-racism, I think it's more than just implicit bias of recognizing that, but what do we do with that information? So we need to have anti-racism type of training as clinicians to be able to say, okay, I recognize that I have this implicit bias. Now, how do I overcome that so that I can treat this person in front of me and not have all of those barriers or blurriness around it. I just, I wanted to jump in and just add one thing. Um, I'm the lawyer, so of course I, I'm gonna bring up lawsuits, but I, I, all I wanted to note is there was recently a lawsuit filed. I think the woman's name was Kara Johnson um, who passed away after giving birth in LA. And it's a civil rights lawsuit. It's a racial discrimination lawsuit against the hospital. And I, I believe it's the first one we've seen with, a, with the racial disparity in reproductive health actually filed as a civil rights lawsuit. And it will be very interesting to, to see how that plays out. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to that. Um, you know, I back to what Tina was saying, I, I, I am confident that if there was better listening and better communication, we would have better outcomes. I think the mere fact that families are going in with their concerns and their concerns not being taken seriously, I think we have a serious problem with the lack of communication and the lack of acknowledgement. So I think once going back to the providers and having 
there be able to have a safe conversation with their patient and not be scared to listen to what they have to say and what that's going to lead to. And as far as also the risks and realities of adverse outcomes, I think that there's so much around communication as a whole that we need to improve upon. Um, do I know what that looks like and how to do that? No, but I do know that I personally have also experienced, you know, uh, what it looks like when your provider doesn't listen to you and, and things that could happen. And so I care very much about finding a way to ensure better listening and better communication with providers and their patients. I just wanted to to emphasize what what everyone on this panel is sharing, and I'm sure you know everyone in this group has amazing ideas about the specific policies that can and should be pushed forward. Um, and I also just wanted to um, emphasize again this point that Shawnee brought up about this is a this is a cultural change issue. This is white supremacy culture um, that extends far beyond the walls of hospital systems and birth centers. It's something that starts at birth. Uh, we know that. You know, research shows that from infancy, how babies are being raised um, influences how they are um, a part of white supremacy culture, how you are participating in systemic racism from infancy. Um, so it's really, you know, the responsibility of all of us and especially those with privilege, with white privilege on how we are raising our babies, how we are talking about racism, um, you know, far beyond, you know, before someone is getting pre pregnant, far beyond before someone is having to um, um, think about where they're giving birth or how they're choosing their provider but really this is a cultural change issue that um you know i i love talking amongst ourselves and all the people who are passionate about this but we should be bringing in business leaders and uh you know people who have nothing to do with the perinatal space because really this this issue of tackling systemic racism um has to bring everyone in and it has to start uh before and beyond the perinatal period Absolutely. Amari, I want to give you a chance to um, chat in this conversation as well, if you have any thoughts on this question. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, my, I mean, my stance, I mean, I, I you know, second everything everybody has been saying as a father, um, as somebody who's, who's lost their partner, um, it, the, the biggest and realest issue is that, you know, my children's lives is just forever changed. You know, it doesn't matter who steps up, it doesn't matter who steps in, it doesn't matter how well off we become. Um, their, lives will, their lives will forever be different without, you know, without their mother being, you know, being with them and, and through their journey. You know, um, one, one thing as we were speaking, I was really thinking of is that it's, and it's, it's just the reality of the situation is like when my son is two years old now and when he <laughs> when he's doing something and he gets upset like you know he's calling for daddy 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 but then when daddy when i come you know and, and he's mad at me you know the the reality is is that there is nobody else so he calls on me still so <laughs> so if he's upset you know it's daddy 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 and he's trying to run and find somebody and he comes back to me you know so and you know I mean, my kids are beautiful, they're great, and it's really cute, but at the same time, you know, it, it bothers me because, you know, there is no other um, option for them at this point, you know, so, you know, there's, there's things that like that, that, you know, really drive me to do, you know, do the work and, you know, meet families and, and create this community um, because, you know, support is, is paramount. You know, when you're going through certain things, you know, and, and you need people to turn to, a lot of people just don't have the support and don't know where to get the support from. And it can be, um, you know, traumatic. It's already a traumatic situation that we've all had to deal with. But just being able to have groups like this and discussions like this, you know, it really does um, allow you to kind of breathe and know that, you know, there are other people going through the same thing and, you know, can provide some insight for you. Thank you so much. And I think that really brings to light the fact that when we're talking about stillbirth, when we're talking about maternal mortality and infant loss, we're not talking like we can look at the statistics and we can see the numbers, but it's so important to realize that these are real people, that your children's lives are forever changed because of a horrifying tragedy that was absolutely preventable. And I think that whenever we have these discussions, it's it's easy to get stuck in the numbers and it's it is painful, but it's so important to look at the people. 
we'll go ahead and get started on our next question, which is, what advice would you give to a pregnant person who is concerned about the care that they are receiving, and especially a person of color or someone who identifies as a member of another marginalized group, such as LGBTQ+. I'll jump in. Um, I often say to the folks that I have the privilege to work with is um, you need to date um, those providers like you would date somebody who's a potential intimate partner. Um, how are they speaking to you? Are they looking at you when they are um, engaging you? Are they answering your, your questions and being respectful? Um, when I think about, I'm 53, so when I think about my journey with um, medical providers, I've had folks that were just so disengaged, like moving like a conveyor belt through the process of being with me. I think about my birthing experiences. I had a very traumatic birth with my second child. Um, she had a birth defect. Um, I was in severe pain. Um, she was flown out to another hospital. My husband, and former husband and I had to drive to her and nobody asked me how I was doing. I was a black woman away from my family. I was like a poster child for all of the things that happened to me. I went through severe postpartum depression and psychoses and nobody said, are you okay? I just gave birth, I had a traumatic birth. Baby had a birth defect. They didn't check in and say, mom, like how are you processing this? And I got really, really sick. And it's by the grace, divine intervention that I'm still here because I had thoughts of taking my own life, taking my daughter's life, my second daughter's life. It was really bad. And so shop for your providers. And if you don't feel comfortable, even if it's an intuitive feel, they might be saying all the right things, use all of your intelligences to determine whether this is a good fit, it's a partnership, you know your body better than the provider. If they're not listening to you and trying to talk you out of stuff, make note and ask them if they will put in your record that they said no, not no to this test or something that you asked them to do because you're experiencing discomfort or you just wanna know what your options are. We must take our power back um, with regard to our care. Hey, this is LJ. I'll jump in. I love what you said. It's taking your power back. I tell people all the time, even as a practitioner, sometimes you got to fire your practitioner, right? And we get very comfortable. We don't want to rock the boat. I hear it a lot in my practice. It's like my mama used it, grandmama used it, and then we've all went here, our whole family. And I'm like, here's the deal. Just because that provider has been with your family 40, 50 years, they could be amazing, but if they're not listening to you and your specific needs, right? If you come in and say something and they're like, oh, just like your mother, just like your grandmother, possibly, right? But it's a unique situation, right? The other thing I love that you said is I always tell people, have them documented in the charts, right? If you're saying something, if you have questions, it's really interesting because sometimes they'll push back and be like, hey, you know, we're not able to do that. And my biggest thing is awesome. Thank you, Dr. Such and Such. Document that in my chart and I'm going to leave this appointment with that in my chart, right? It's not one of those put it in the notes next week, follow up with me like, oh yeah, I'll leave when the notes are updated, you know, because then it's like, oh, they don't want to document in their chart that they can't check your calcium or that they can't do this or that they don't want to because then it makes them look incompetent. And so I had one doctor, um, you know, do that. And he basically just came back and was like, you win. And I'm like, well, I didn't know we were in a tussle, number one. <laughs> Number two, it's like, this is my life, right? You may be in here with me 10, 15 minutes. I've got two, I'm a single parent. I've got to go home to children, family, business, and I'm suffering. So you really do have to hold them accountable. And then sometimes bringing someone with you, right? Because maybe you don't have the right words. Maybe you're in pain. I've been in those appointments where I was so frustrated. I could, you could ask me my social security number and I couldn't have told you, like I was so upset and beside myself, but to have someone there as an advocate that can kind of have some notes really bring in some of the facts because I think sometimes we get very emotional and once you get fired up right we can turn that sassy black woman we're like oh honey we're gonna clean this up real quick right but that's not always what's going to get us the best results right so I, I love what you shared and I just wanted to add that to that and to piggyback off of you LJ that is exactly what um, I was going to add to the conversation as well um, is knowing that you can bring a support person there with you when you have these conversations with your provider whether that's a family member um, a doula a peer support worker anyone else who's a part of your care team during pregnancy and you know having them present so that you can feel comfortable with expressing these concerns and then seeing what the response is and knowing that if the the response that you receive from your provider isn't what you were looking for, then figuring out how you can continue to uh, escalate those concerns. Um, my sister is always uh, my advocate when it comes to these things as a, you know, Black woman with chronic illnesses. Um, and 
she is also a healthcare admin, so she knows um, how to escalate if we don't get the response that we want from the person that I'm seeing. And so that's always a, a, a good way to have someone present with you. I just, I just want to add, and I agree wholeheartedly with what all of you are saying. I think many of us preach the same message that we need to like empower people to feel comfortable to advocate for themselves and especially their unborn babies, because we're the ones that know our bodies the best. And we're the ones that know our babies the best. And through my experience, I have seen that, you know, we all are we all are raised to believe that these healthcare professionals all know that what they say is the final word. And what I've learned the hard way is that's not always necessarily true. And so the message that I'm always trying to instill in people is that they need to advocate for themselves and they have permission. It is their human right to be able to speak up for themselves. And so, and if they don't get the answer that they want, they have the power to go somewhere else to get the care that they need, that they're not locked into their provider, that they're not stuck. They can, you know, go and try to help themselves and, and find someone else that will listen to them. But yeah, no, I, I, we, we need better communication. We need people to feel more comfortable and confident that what they have to say does matter. I can give an example of a lived experience, actually, that just happened after we lost our daughter, Maya, last year. Um, I think I mentioned very earlier um, during introduction that I felt blindsided. And to that point, it's really that as I was going through the IVF journey, whatever my reproductive endocrinologist told me to do, I did exactly that. I didn't ask questions. I didn't do research. I didn't use my clinical brain, even though I have that clinical training. So after losing Maya, I just kind of like, you know what? You can tell me something. Let me do the research. Let me look into it and let me ask the questions from other providers and get other opinions. And I think everyone is saying the same thing about like, get other opinions, continue to ask these questions because if you're not getting the answer that you want, and sometimes there might not be an answer and that's fine. It's it's better that a provider will tell you like, right now we don't know, rather than saying that they do know and they give you a different answer than there really isn't any research backing for that. And I think with that, really is why we are pushing for like folks to ask the questions for folks to help bring to light what we don't know and how can we find answers to those questions through research and continue to push forward more information that you know healthcare has on only gone so far and in my mind previous to losing my I thought we'd come a long way you know, IVF has been around for a while, but no, it has. It's only been around for 50 years, and there's so much we don't know, just like in stillbirth, just like in pregnancy loss, and um, all the complications associated, not just with pregnancy, but with, like, health outcomes. There's so many things we don't know, but unless we ask the question, we're not going to get the answer or even have someone to advocate for getting that answer. Thank you so much. Um, Jill, I actually want to want to push this question to you. What are some of the legal, ram, uh, you know, ramifications, or what's what's someone's legal options if they feel that they are being discriminated against in a medical setting? Um, obviously, I guess we we're kind of waiting to see this from the Kira Johnson case, but I would love to hear any advice that you have for um, if someone does want to look into their legal options. First, I have to give the caveat that I am far from an expert on discrimination law. So I cannot comment really on that lawsuit. Um, I, I mean, I, I, oh, this is, uh, y'all, this is so heartbreaking and frustrating. Of course, like the answer is to try to advocate for yourself, but it's just so darn frustrating that we should have to in the first place, right? Um, and, you know, and how many comments I've seen today about how my doctor didn't take it seriously and, and look what happened. And, you know, um, there, you know, if the, if the doctor didn't follow the standard of care, then there is the possibility of a tort lawsuit. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of legal hiccups in the way. I should, I, I guess I'll call them hiccups. Um, a big one is, is a, a place like California has, has a damage cap for non-economic damages. Um, so in the case of of a stillbirth, really the only, um, sorry, I don't say only to minimize, obviously, but the only damages are non-economic, right? That 
that the emotional distress that we suffer. Um, but those are capped at $250,000 and that's a lot of money, but it's also not. Um, and it's hard to find a lawyer for just that amount. And I understand there's a, there's a ballot petition. There's a ballot measure on California to get rid of that or to change the damage cap. Um, so unfortunately there's a lot of, um, things that, that are, are, are discouraging lawsuits after, um, stillbirth, but of course it's still possible. And there are some lawyers out there who are willing. I just talked to one a few weeks ago who was just irate, um, about, and it was a, it was an EPV issue of measuring the placenta and the mom was 39 weeks. Um, and I do sort of have this idealized version of tort law that this is how we make change. Right. Um, and that's how our system is also sort of set up. That's really not probably the best way to do it, but right. That's how, that's how our system is set up. And if we, if, if we have not only people who are willing to, to advocate them for themselves in medical care, but also pursue legal options, I mean, that might be what forces doctors to change. Um, again, I wish we had easier answers, right? I wish we had, you know, government run healthcare. I wish we had like that we could change things in an easier way. Um, but yes, there are there are some some laws out there that are not really helping uh, for lawsuits, both both for maternal mortality and for infant mortality and for stillbirth. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, so we just have about five minutes left, and our final question is: What needs to change in order for the medical system to be held accountable? And what I want, I really want to tailor this question to. Also, what are some actionable items that we can have? Obviously, we talked about advocating for ourselves, and I think that's incredibly important. And like we've all said, it's important and exhausting. But um, I would love to also just see what a brainstorm, maybe what are some things that we can take from our conversation today and say, this is what I am going to do in my own part to, to really create change. I want to jump in and share because I think about community often before I think about these systems that impact us, that we have more power than we actually recognize. And so it's one thing for me to sit and talk with Deb and Allie and Emily about how horribly I was treated by the doctor when I went to my appointment. It's a whole other story if I actually post that somewhere and the three of us speak about Dr. Smith um, being rude and um, ignoring or being disrespectful. And if enough of those get posted and enough conversation gets out there, then nobody will patronize Dr. Smith. Also just having a report card. Um, it was mentioned by Jill about the standard of care. I, um, I'm like, that terminology for me is kind of sketchy, not from Jill, but just the system that says standard of care. As a black woman, if you know and have doing, done your, your homework, you know that you can't just do with me what you have done with my white counterparts. Because what can happen with me and my body based on weathering and you know just the impact of just these systems and just living life as a black or brown woman, um, a birthing person, that um, the toxic stress and the different things that I deal with makes my body, um, it just has my body, body wired differently. So you might check all the boxes and I'll die. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, this is something that we need to work on and shift. Shani, I love that you say that. And my head automatically goes to, we need to be able to conduct more clinical trials, folks that can trust those clinical trials, right? That you're not just using that information like Henrietta Locks and, you know, without permission, et cetera. I think there's a culture of untrust. And how do we shift that to a culture of trust so that we can actually conduct clinical trials with the um, colored population? Because we know that majority of clinical trials conducted on medications and uh, medicine uh, with you know, the way that we care for patients, it's not on the colored population, right? So to your point, Shani, we can't just have the standard of care for those that are within that clinical trial, which is majority white, and be able to translate that information for the black folks, for the Asian folks, for et cetera. It just doesn't work that way. So until we get to a point where we can pull in more information, standardize that way, I don't think that we can truly say that we treat this person this way, we're gonna treat this person that same way, and we're gonna end up with the same results. I, I totally agree with you. And that 
is kind of tied into the piece of legislation that I've been working on, the um, Civil Birth Health Improvement and Education for Autumn Act, which is a federal piece of legislation that would provide funding to improve the data collection and the analysis and the research so that we can better begin to prevent these losses. And um, I think that we just, we don't have enough information and we don't like to be able to draw in the decision makers and say, here's the proof in the pudding. We have been consistent and concise with the data that we have collected and this is what it is showing. We just don't have that in this country. And I, and I remain hopeful really, 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 really hopeful that, um, you know, we could get this piece of legislation passed so that it's, it's the beginning. I mean, it, I mean, there is so much work that needs to be done, but until we are collecting consistent and concise data through from every state in the nation, we are always going to be like lagging behind what is happening elsewhere. So, um, I agree. We need that information. And then I, I believe we may have a better chance at getting people to actually listen to us about what needs to be done. I think data, information is power. Yes, I'll follow in Deb, exactly what I was going to say. Um, having an accurate assessment of how medical and healthcare systems address maternal morbidity and mortality and infant mortality is the only way it'll be helpful to us in holding them accountable. And then on the back end, that way we can enforce programs and initiatives to turn these systems around, specifically for BIPOC communities that you know are the ones being impacted. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming today for taking the time. I know we're running a little bit late and also just for, you know, sharing your stories and, and for sharing your hearts with us. I mean, it's, I'm so emotional right now and I'm so full of, um, so much optimism as well as just so much like heart, my heart is just broken at the same time. So I really appreciate all of your stories and, um, thank you all so much for joining this panel.